Okay, this is um, the review session for the final, uh, which is an exam week. Um, it's not a comprehensive final, it re revolves mainly around the material in the last portion of the class, and the individual topical areas, I guess, are those shown here. Uh, pipe, net, pipe flow and networks, which are weeks 10 and 11. External flows, which are week uh, 12. Open channel flows, uh, which are week 13, and also going back slightly to dimensional analysis, which is included on the previous uh, test, midterm three, but also is present here, at least the concepts are. Um, I'll try and be as brief as possible. Um, the best way for you to uh, prepare, I think, is probably to look at the, the previous broader review, in detailed review for 2016, which is about an hour or so, uh, which covers these same topics. Um, but I'll try in this session just to identify the key equations that you need, and then you shouldn't need any more than the ones that we mentioned in this particular case. Uh, there are three questions, each worth 110 points as usual. Um, I guess the one thing that's different for the exam is that because another exam will come in immediately after us, it is limited to 110 minutes, so 10 minutes short of two hours. And so consequently, it's a bit more straightforward maybe than the prior test. Anyway, three questions, each worth 110 points. One on pipes and pipe networks, which are chapters 10 and really the main part in, in uh, week 11, rather. Uh, external flows, uh, looking at drag and lift uh, and their forces applied to structures, which is week or topic uh, 12, uh, but also includes some a part of dimensional analysis, um, which we talked about in, in uh, week 9. And an open channel flow question, which is week 13, and it's not really gradually varying flows, it's more uh, uniform flow, I think. So anyway, in terms of topical areas, those are they. As I mentioned already, um, look at the final for 2016 and the review session for that, the recorded review session for that. And the concepts are really limited to weeks 9 through 13 for what we've done in this class. So I'll go through them individually, starting off in, um, in week 9. So week nine was dimensional analysis. And the principal concepts of dimensional analysis, uh, you recall um, we did an example which looked at flow within a pipe. Um, the pipe flows at some velocity. The pipe has a diameter of D, um, it has a relative roughness of epsilon, which we can normalize with um, D, uh, has an upstream pressure maybe applied to it, and it has components of viscosity and density in the pipe. And so we know that from this we can define the number of parameters which define behavior which in this case would be one, two, three, four, five, and six. So six uh, variables. Uh, we can calculate how many of these uh, components of mass, length, and time are included. And we know, for instance, that um, density includes mass and volume. And we know, for instance, that velocity includes length and time. And so in this particular case, all three of these are represented. And so the number of pi groups in this particular case are going to be 6 minus 3, which are equal to 3. And then what we can do is we can use um, a couple of different ways to, to, get, to, to define the groups. Uh, we mainly used um, Buckingham Pi, which I won't go through here again. And which you don't need to use on the exam. Uh, but we can also do it by just inspection. And that is by just choosing um, combinations of these properties that when you group them together, they give you um, groupings that have no dimensions attached to them. And most importantly, I guess, for this, we know that for any kind of um, analysis that we want to do, 
we know that the pi groups for the model should be equal to the pi groups for the prototype, the actual structure. And we have to satisfy three requirements. We have to satisfy uh, geometric similitude. In other words, the scaled down model should have all the dimensions shrunk in the same proportion. So in this case, um, the relative roughnesses for this case should be the same. That's an example of geometric similitude. Um, the flow regime should be the same, which is kinematic similitude. And that kind of came up mostly when we looked at external flows. For instance, when we looked at flow around a sphere, the Reynolds number is the property that controls whether the flow looks like a creeping flow, which is viscous dominated, or whether it has separation on the backside at a higher Reynolds number. So in this case, Reynolds number zero uh, would be small, and this would be large. And so kinematic similitude is often given by Reynolds number equivalent as the pi groups that are considered. And third is dynamic similitude. And that's typically defined when the Euler numbers are the same. And that is that you can calculate what the forces are in a structure by making sure that not only is the flow regime identical in both cases, but also that the forces applied on the structure in that same flow regime are also equivalent to each other. So that's um, a basic uh, rehash of dimensional analysis from week nine. So review that. You won't have to use Buckingham Pi, I'll repeat that. Uh, week 10, and I guess week 11 as well, um, was pipe flow. And networks. Um, which were really in week 11. Um, we went through pipe flow last time, so maybe I can do it just quickly. Uh, you know that we use a Moody diagram. You know that it defines a friction factor, which is also very similar to a drag coefficient or a lift coefficient versus Reynolds number. It gets divided into two regions. One is laminar and one is turbulent. We know that in each of these regimes, in the Lamb regime, there is a relationship which gives us the friction factor is equal to some coefficient divided by Reynolds number. Uh, we know that in the turbulent regime, then typically the magnitudes of the friction factors are a function of relative roughness. And these kinds of behaviors actually are the same as you'd expect to see in flows for drag and lift around objects as well. And so you get the same kinds of behaviors for lift and drag for external flows um, as you do for pipe flows. Um, we know that when we look at the behavior for um, flows, we use the energy equation, which is really just um, Bernoulli's equation written between an upstream and a downstream. It has to be upstream and downstream by our convention and that there are head losses applied within the system. And we can write Bernoulli's equation just as we usually do. I always write it in terms of lengths with the component that represents the pump head that you put into the system and then the downstream components which are defined equivalently. Velocity squared over 2g and some of all the, the head losses. And these head losses may be the head losses due to uh, bends in the pipe, which are just loss coefficients multiplied by the velocity head in the pipe. 
not necessarily the ones or the twos, but actually in the pipe. And the head losses due to uh, flow within the pipes are a friction factor, length over diameter, and again, the velocity head within that section of the pipe, not the, the magnitude at the ends. If it's a big tank, then the velocities are typically zero because uh, the velocity in the tank, if you ride it on the surface of the tank, is, um, is not moving, and so you can get rid of this term. If the tank is atmospheric, then the pressure is zero, and the elevations are just the elevations between upstream and, and downstream. I guess additionally, uh, we've used the energy equation to divide, uh, define the pump head as being equal to the power in watts. So newtons meters per second or joules um, per second, which are watts, the rate of doing work. And as a function of gravitational acceleration and the mass flow rate, m dot. And of course, m dot is just volumetric flow rate multiplied by uh, density. So we can use those. Usually uh, we can solve the equations for these terms that we have here. If we only have, uh, if we have two parameters which we don't know, then we can often write conservation of mass. And that is that the sum of the mass flow rates are equal to zero, which is the same as basically writing V1, A1 equals V2, A2, if these are the cross-sectional areas at the upstream and downstream locations. Velocities are always uh, along streamlines for these, so they're always uh, down, downstream along the streamline, so we need to be cognizant of that. So that's really uh, the topics related to pipe flow. I guess we also need to know something about networks. And uh, networks come in, I suppose, three flavors. They come in series, they come in parallel, and they come in, uh, if you like, a network. And the um, controls on these vary for each one. I guess we've looked at these examples where we have flow from upstream to downstream um, in series. In pipe one and in pipe two. And so in this place, um, I guess that is, actually that's in parallel, isn't it? So never mind. So in this particular case, um, Q1, uh, Q total is equal to the sum of the flow rates. But in this particular case, the head loss in component one is equal to the head loss in component two, because they both subscribe to this um, delta H, delta Z that is here. So the flow rates are additive, but the head losses are identical. If we look in series flow, then that is flow going from one pipe to a smaller pipe. Pipe section one, two, three, etc. And so this is the converse of this, in that um, Q1 has to equal Q2, which has to equal Q3, etc. But the head losses in each of these components are additive. So the total head loss in the system is equal to the sum of the head losses for all, in this particular case, four components. So the total head loss in the system is equal to the sum of all those components. And for uh, network flows, which we have here, which might be a single pipe that branches, oops, in 
into a second downstream tank where we have pipe sections one, two, and three. Then we know that because coming from this point here, the flow into this downstream tank comes from the same pressure head at this location and to the same head at these locations, then the head loss in parts two and the head loss in parts three have to be equal to each other. And so we can write that equivalency for this particular network. And if we need to solve it, we can go by solving first through um, one network where we can write Bernoulli's equation for pipes one and two. And we can also solve Bernoulli's equation by writing it in the lower network, which are for pipes um, one and three. And from that, with these constraints on these downstream head losses, we can uh, constrain the behavior to be able to typically solve for whatever we want to solve for in that particular case. Okay. The um, next topic is external flows. So for us, that was week 12. We can calculate the forces on structures by summing up the pressures and the viscous drag forces together. Um, and we have an expression for that, but we rarely have to use that. Rather, we use evaluations of drag and lift, which conform to um, the magnitudes of the drag forces, for instance, that might be applied on a structure that is falling with some force which is its uh, weight, which might have a buoyant force attached to it, and which might also have, uh, in this case, a flow around it, which gives it an additional, in this case, a drag force. Drag is being measured in the direction of the flow, Lift is being uh, measured perpendicular to it. And in terms of the expressions that define that, we can define a drag coefficient, which is equal to the applied drag force, a half density, the flow velocity far away from the system, and an appropriate area. In this case, the area would be the frontal circular area of this sphere that's dropping through a liquid. Uh, where this is uh, measured parallel to the flow. And for coefficient of lift, um, it's, it's exactly analogous, where this is the lift force, a half density of the fluid it's traveling through, uh, the velocity in the far field, and the appropriate area. The areas in these might be different, because if this is a wing, this might be the planiform area. And if it was a wing, then this might be the frontal area of the wing. Uh, but typically, you can figure out exactly what that would be if you're using these expressions. Um, this is always the far field velocity, not the local velocity. And this is his, a magnitude of lift. Uh, and in these expressions, this ratio of d over a, or l over a, are equal to a pressure. In other words, the difference in pressure on this side versus this side is really the, the net drag that's applied. And so in this particular case, this would really be an Euler number, which is pressure divided by rho v squared. The P, this is a force, which is the same as this term here. And you could, if you want, include the half there. We don't usually in Euler's number, but we do in convention for drag coefficients just because it appears within the Bernoulli equation as this, a half v squared. So just by convention. Um, what else do we need to know for these? Uh, we know that if we look at um, the behaviors of these, they're a little bit like um, flow in a pipe charts. Reynolds number versus coefficient of drag. And we know that the 
behaviors that we have are really quite similar to the ones that we have um, for flow in a pipe with this transition from behaviors at uh, high Reynolds number to low Reynolds number. And so these define the, the, the regimes of behavior and not unlike the Moody charts, this relation here is that the coefficient of drag or coefficient of lift for that matter is equal to some constant divided by Reynolds number. So the product of these two is always a constant. Um, and that tells you something about the gradient of this line. Um, this is usually uh, in log space on both axes because the changes in these forces and Reynolds numbers are usually quite, quite large. If you're solving these problems, it matters which of these regimes you're working in. If you're working in the, the laminar, or if you're working in the turbulent, uh, because if you go through uh, identifying the coefficient of drag with the Reynolds number, then this velocity squared term that comes in here ends up being changed so that the, the drag force or the lift force is directly proportional to the velocity. And the drag force is also proportional to the viscosity because it'll be um, viscous drag controlled. And in this regime here, the drag force is proportional to the velocity squared. And the drag force will not be proportional to the viscosity, but it will be proportional to the, the density of the fluid. And so these are just the, the way that the expressions work out. So that if you're solving for a particle falling through water, then you're physically on this side of this division line. And if you're solving for a particle that falls through air, like um, a hailstone dropping through a cloud, a thundercloud, then the flow is turbulent and the coefficient of drag is typically constant in this magnitude, in this regime. So we can solve based on those behaviors. If we want to solve for composite flows, um, composite drag, if you like. Then the way to do that is just to sum the components due to the individual, sum the behaviors due to the individual components. This is the example I think we did in class, where if you look at the, the drag force that's applied to the sphere, if you look at the drag force that's applied to the cylinder, then uh, the sum of forces is just equal to those two added to each other. Or if you're looking at moments taken around here, it will be just those magnitudes multiplied through by each of the um, lever arms that are present. So the sum of the moments in this particular case would be equal to the drag force on the um, cylinder multiplied by the lever arm plus the drag force operating on the sphere, multiplying by the, the lever arm for that as well. And they would be at half heights on each of these, uh, just because of the distributions, just as you know that the, um, the pressure distribution be uniform on this, and so you'd imagine that it works at half height. Okay, uh, and finally, uh, the material for um, open channel flows in week 13. Um, well, we're typically looking at behavior um, within a channel. It's not a very well-drawn well channel in this particular case, but one nonetheless. Some value of um, a uniform velocity, which we can also convert into a volumetric flow rate. We can define the behavior of such a channel in terms of its hydraulic radius, which by definition is just equal to the cross-sectional area divided by the perimeter. Um, the cross-sectional area for a flow here, of course, would be this part here, 
the perimeter, the flow perimeter would be um, this length plus this length plus this length added together. And so if you had an, an additional um, baffle in the middle of this flow, then you need to accommodate the appropriate magnitudes of the perimeter, which would also include this, both sides of this added to this overall flow. So you need to be aware of that. We need to define behavior in terms of the appropriate uh, kinematic regime, for which we use Reynolds number. And we define Reynolds number typically in terms of hydraulic radius, velocity, density, and viscosity. The velocity is usually an average velocity taken as uniform over the, the segment. If we're looking at uh, uniform flows, which you may be, then we can use the Manning equation, which says that this average velocity across the flow regime, a flow channel, is equal to a coefficient, which in SI units is always one, divided by the Manning coefficient, and multiplied through by the hydraulic radius to the power of two over three, and multiplied by the slope of the bed to uh, the factor of a half. And the slope is just equal to length divided by drop, I guess. So S0 is equal to, um, well, sorry, the other way around, isn't it? Drop divided by length. So one meter in a kilometer would be the appropriate magnitude for that, if uh, that was going to be the, its magnitude. Now we can get the volumetric flow rate is just equal to the uniform velocity multiplied through by the cross-sectional area, which is the same as this area here, which gives us the same expression as above, where the only change is that it adds in, well, I can write it out, this is equal to 1 if it's SI. This is equal to the Manning coefficient, which is really just a friction factor, assuming that the flow is always turbulent. It's a cross-sectional area, hydraulic radius to the 2 over 3, and the slope of the bed to the half. So those are for uniform flows. For gradually varying flows, then we often use the magnitude of the energy, specific energy. which we call E, and that is equal to the depth of flow plus the flow per unit width squared divided by two times gravity over the depth squared. And so in a channel where we look at these behaviors, then if this is the depth of flow, then this length here is the depth. And the flow per unit width would be Q, where this is equal to one a unit width of the channel. So this is flow per unit width, this is depth of the channel, this is gravity, and the units of this are in, in terms of, of energy. And uh, that's it. So I'm pretty sure, in fact, I'm confident that everything that you need for the exam is included on this, uh, these couple of pages. Uh, you may need to review the concepts to understand exactly what they mean. Um, and for that, uh, going to 2016 uh, recording of what's going on and using the, um, the written notes, which are also included online to be able to go through that, will put you in a good um, position to be able to, to show your best performance on this test. Okay? Good luck. It's been great having you in class and uh, wish you well in your careers. Take care. Thanks.